Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Hugh Durant White. I'm the chief scientist uh, and engineer, and I think relevant perhaps for this uh, particular seminar, I'm also the uh, commissioner for natural resources. Um, so, uh, welcome to the second uh, of this year's uh, breakfast uh, seminars. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, the calendar uh, for future events for this year is now, I think, on your seats. And you can see we've got a pretty exciting program. Uh, and also, uh, just today, uh, try as far as possible to maintain social distancing. And I'm sure you've scanned in and you've used hand sanitizer and so on. We are in a very fortunate position in Australia, and we want to try and keep it that way until we all kind of get vaccinated. Uh, those watching on live stream, you're able to submit questions via the chat function on the right-hand side of the screen, and time permitting, these will be asked at the end of the seminar. I'm very, very pleased today uh, to um, have uh, Belinda uh, Medlin, Distinguished Professor in Ecosystem Modeling at the Hawkesbury Institute for the Environment at Western Sydney University to speak to us. I've sort of, uh, she may not know it, but actually for the last year or more, I've actually been looking at her work because I'm kind of slightly involved in dieback and, and other areas, and I thought it would be really good to have her um, come and speak to us. She's doing some very, very exciting work bringing together uh, not just modeling methods, but also experimental information and infrastructure and so on, uh, and genuinely building what I think is a world-class center of excellence uh, out at uh, Western Sydney University. Uh, Belinda's research aims to predict how terrestrial ecosystems will respond to increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide and climate change. She collaborates with colleagues around Australia and the world to translate information from plant and ecosystem experiments into models of vegetation function. In today's talk, Belinda will look at how the resilience of Australia's forests and woodlands are being tested as our climate changes. Belinda will demonstrate recent research on the effects of CO2 enrichment, heat waves and drought, and survey the changes in vegetation already occurring and discuss what the future holds for the Australian bush. In addition to leading the Hawkesbury Institute's ecosystem function and integration theme, in 2018, Belinda launched the Dead Tree Detective, a citizen science initiative helping to inform which trees are vulnerable to drought and dieback and to understand what steps are needed to protect them. And in 2019, Belinda received the ARC Georginia Sweet Laureate Fellowship. This is the most prestigious fellowship that the ARC uh, provide to any researcher. Um, uh, uh, her fellowship will enable a rethink of the pipeline career model, so creating resources for nonlinear career paths and supporting women in high school and university to develop quantitative skills. Please join me in welcoming Professor Belinda Medlin from Western Sydney University as she presents Climate Change and Australian Vegetation. Where are we headed? Thanks so much, Hugh, for the introduction. Um, it's so wonderful to be live again. I've been giving seminars by Zoom for the last year, um, and I can't tell you how lovely it is to actually have faces looking back at me, real faces. Um, such, a, such a pleasure. Um, so I would also like to start my talk by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which I work, which is pretty much all of Australia. Um, I acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, I want to talk about uh, the Australian vegetation. Um, and where are we headed? When, when I talk to my neighbours and my family about Australian vegetation, they, I know what they're thinking of. They're thinking generally of eucalypts. Um, and uh, they've got you know, a kind of picture of of what the Australian vegetation is like. Um, but I wanted to start by, by re-emphasising the incredible diversity of Australian vegetation. So even just in New South Wales, the sorts of vegetation that we have ranges from Gondwanan rainforests, um, the extraordinary environments in the, in the Alps, um, to semi-arid woodlands and Mitchell Plains grasslands out by the corner country. So it's a really great diversity of types of vegetation and it's really shaped by climate is the other thing to think about is the these these differences in types of vegetation 
are really, really strongly determined by the climates in which they occur. Now, this vegetation is incredibly valuable to us for a number of reasons. It's valuable from a cultural perspective. Um, so many of us who spend time in these places, skiers, um, bushwalkers, um, uh, indigenous people, have really close connections with these landscapes, which are really valuable. Um, but of course, their value goes beyond, well beyond that. Um, uh, they provide us with food and fiber, they sequester carbon, they regulate water, they regulate the climate, um, they regulate water availability. Um, and something that I'm always at pains to emphasize in public talks, um, they provide habitat for a bunch of creatures that, um, that people really like to see. Um, so when you think about these vegetation types, think about what lives there as well. Um, so we're not just talking about vegetation, we're talking about the ecosystem as a whole because these vegetation types are a habitat for a wide range um, of creatures. Um, so they're valuable, they're diverse, they're shaped by climate, they're also really dynamic. And this is something that we um, often don't really think about until it hits us in the face, as it did um, two years ago. So here are some examples of the dynamism of Australian vegetation. Um, so the top left-hand one um, was a picture submitted to the Dead Tree Detective um, from out near Mudgee uh, in late 2019, um, looking at how the drought had impacted on canopies. Um, and you'll see later in this talk just how widespread the browning of that vegetation was. Um, fire, of course, has major impacts um, on vegetation. Uh, these, these are fairly short-term impacts, um, but we really need to think about the long-term consequences. So the, the vegetation is dynamic on longer terms as well. Um, so the, the bottom left-hand picture that I have here um, is from the Monero High Plain. That dieback event um, occurred over the course of about 20 years. So in the early 2000s, people started to see dieback occurring um, in the Viminalis trees um, on the High Plain, to the extent now that there are very few of those trees left in that region. Um, and so there's been a really great change um, in the ecosystem um, and in the functioning of the ecosystem due to the loss of those trees, which um, Greening Australia is now attempting to restore um, in some locations. The bottom right one um, is a really interesting example, which I like to show um, because it, it also looks bad. Um, and often when you show that picture to people, they're like, oh my goodness, you know, the trees have all died. Um, that's dreadful. Um, but what's happening in this one, so this is in the Northern Territory, um, and actually about 50 years ago, there were no trees on that property. It used to be grassland. Um, and so what's happened there is that there was a change in rainfall patterns, which allowed the trees to invade. Um, but then there was a failure of the monsoon over two years which caused the trees to die. Um, so we're now looking at, um, and so this is an example of, of the dynamism that you can actually have of trees invading and then, and then um, dying back. And actually the, the, um, the pastoralist who owns this property is quite excited about the trees going because it's opening up the property um, for the cattle. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting <laughs> example um, to, to contemplate um, because it demonstrates just how dynamic um, vegetation can be and what the consequences are for land management. Um, just one more um, example to demonstrate dynamism. So this is um, uh, a map and graph taken from my colleagues at the Australian National University. Um, Albert Van Dyke um, has this Australia's Environment Explorer which publishes a report each year um, looking at um, various features of uh, the environment and so this one just demonstrates annual um, vegetation carbon uptake over time. And you can see the dynamism um, in that carbon uptake, how variable it is from year to year, um, and how, cl 
closely related that is to the incredible variability in rainfall that we have. Um, so there is, um, there's a lot of impact of climate on the vegetation. It's very dynamic, but it should also be predictable. So the, the question that I have been chasing in my research um, over the last 15 years um, is really to what degree can we predict these impacts, both on the short term and on the longer term timescale? Um, can we really predict how Australian vegetation will change in response to um, the big drivers, which include things like drought, fire, warming, and rising CO2? Um, and I'd really like to be able to say, here is the answer, here are the predictions, um, but we're not quite at that stage yet. Um, that's where we're headed. Uh, what I really want to do today is to kind of give you an update of what we've um, managed so far uh, in terms of predictions um, and understanding of what those impacts are likely to be. Um, so I want to start with drought. And the reason I'll start with drought is because I think that this is the region in which we've, the, the driver on which we've made the most progress. Um, we have now a really good understanding of the impacts of drought on vegetation. Um, and in particular, what happens as trees um, go into extreme drought. Um, and so to think about the underlying physiology, what's actually happening um, in a... What's happening in a tree, um, water is coming in through the root system, it's being drawn up through the xylem, um, and it comes out through the stomata, which are pores in the leaves. And it's driven by a water potential gradient. So that water is under tension. So this, the tree itself is a bit like a straw, and, and the atmosphere is, is like a person sucking on that straw. Um, and you can envisage um, drought as being something like the... the, the liquid that the person's sucking on getting thicker and thicker, and so the pressure in the straw getting greater and greater. And you know yourselves, if you, if you try and suck a really thick, thick shake through a straw, what happens to that straw is that it will collapse and, and stop, uh, stop uh, allowing you to drink your thick shake, um, which is kind of an analogy for what happens under drought. Um, you've got um, the water being sucked up um, through the xylem, um, and we can actually envisage this process, process um, using um, microcomputed tomography. It's a technique that my colleague Brendan Choate uses um, down in Melbourne at the Synchrotron to visualise the xylem transporting water as a tree is placed under stress. And so here what you have is xylem that are filled with water and a couple that are filled with air. Um, and as the tree is placed under stress, what happens is those xylems start to cavitate, air bubbles form because they're under such pressure. Um, and the more stress you place the tree under, eventually all of the xylem fills with air and the plant can no longer transport water. And that's really the point at which that stem dies. Um, and so that understanding that, of that process really allows us to develop models to describe how trees function during drought. And we understand that there's, um, there's kind of two phases. There are, there's a phase at which the plants are shutting their stomata to try and avoid losing water. Um, but once their stomata are shut, they will continue losing water through the cuticles um, and they, those air bubbles will start to form in the stem um, until you get to the point where you lose all capacity to transport water. Um, and we can characterise that capacity to transport, the, the resistance to embolism, um, with something that we call the, the Xi-50. It's the 50% point um, at which uh, um, xylem are lost. Um, and so that really, it varies very strongly depending on what climate of origin you're looking at. So it varies across the landscape. Um, so some of the work that we've done recently has been trying to measure this point of hydraulic failure in different species coming from different environments. 
Um, and as you can see, um, in wet forest, it's much, uh, um, it's much lower than it is in, in semi-arid woodlands. So what that means, practically, um, is that all of these trees are really adapted to the rainfall environment that they come from. Um, but that means that they also uh, are reasonably close to the threshold for dieback. So as you get droughts in any of these ecosystems, you can see trees dying back. And so we see this in really wet ecosystems in Tasmania during droughts. We also see it in semi-arid woodlands out in western New South Wales during droughts as the water availability passes that threshold. So we understand that that, that threshold really controls um, the plant's capacity to withstand drought, and that allows us to actually make predictions um, of where we expect to see tree death from drought. Um, and so these uh, maps were generated by my colleague, Martin DeCow, from the University of New South Wales, where he's implemented our understanding of those processes um, of drought into a land surface model and used them to uh, make predictions of where we would be most likely to see um, drought death during two of the big droughts that have happened recently, the millennium drought. Um, and uh, we've called it the big dry, for want of a better term, um, the black summer drought. Um, so these predictions, and so what, we, um, what we've been trying to do is to verify these predictions. Um, Martin has used remotely sensed data such as the vegetation optical depth um, to try and compare um, during, the, um, during the millennium drought how well those predictions conform with um, what we can see from remotely sensed data. Um, but we're also very well aware that what we see in the remote sensing data doesn't necessarily really reflect what's happening on the ground. It may reflect a change in the leaf area. The trees may be losing their leaves, but it's hard to pick up when the trees are actually dying. And it's, it's the death that really matters. So if they just lose their leaves, they will bounce back very rapidly. If they die, they're not bouncing back rapidly. Um, so um, as we were doing this project um, in around 2018, we realised that there was a real need to get on the ground measurements. And so we turned to citizen science um, as a way of trying to see what was happening out on the landscape. Um, and we set this up at just the right time, really. We set it up in late 2018, just before um, the incredible drought that we went through in 2019. So we were in a really nice position to capture what happened um, during the course of 2019. And we started to get observations like this. They really started um, during that year up near Brisbane and moved south. Um, and so um, by towards the end of the drought, um, there were more and more observations, particularly going south um, down to the ACT um, and further south than that. Um, so these data uh, have been incredibly useful, um, both for ground truthing what we're seeing from remote sensing, but also in helping us to set up some field plots that we could um, monitor more closely because uh, they allowed us to identify places that would be really good to go and try and capture what was going on. Um, so a group of my colleagues, led by Rachel Nolan and Brendan Choate, um, as well as some collaborators in Armadale um, at the University of New England, um, have been setting up plots to try and monitor what's happening during the drought um, and then following the drought. Um, and so here's an example of some work that was very recently published where um, Rachel Nolan um, and Rhiannon Smith were looking at what was happening, um, some study sites in, in New England. Um, and you can see like the intensity of the drought um, and the dieback that's happened there. Um, and uh, what they did was to identify trees which had been really badly impacted, trees which hadn't been so badly impacted, 
and look at the percent loss of conductivity. So looking at those, um, how much xylem function had been lost. Um, and really what we're seeing is that um, in the trees which weren't very heavily impacted, their xylem was still very functional. In the trees that had been heavily impacted, they'd lost almost all of their xylem function. So that's really helpful to us because it allows us uh, to verify that the, the process that we're describing in our models is correct. So we're really, we are capturing what's going on with our models. Um, and if we can capture this, this process, if we can predict this process of xylem function loss, um, then we should actually be able to predict um, where drought death is likely to occur across the landscape. Um, of course, uh, as they were doing these measurements, it became more and more dangerous to do so um, because of the fact that these landscapes were also starting to go up uh, in flames at the time. Um, and so there is a really strong drought fire connection um, because those, and really it's because the, the foliage was so dry, it means that the fuel was incredibly dry and it's one of the main reasons why the fires that we had um, in that summer were so, um, so severe is because of that severity. And so some of the work that my colleague Rachel Nolan has done is to really look at the connections between what's going on with the drought story and what's going on with the fire story. And you can use the same methods that we use to predict um, xylem function loss to predict fuel moisture content. Um, and so one of the areas of active research at the moment is to translate the that drought research into trying to predict fire risk as well. Um, and so we believe that we're a long way towards being able to predict both drought um, and fire risk in this type of ecosystem. Um, the next horizon is really to what degree can we predict recovery? Um, and so again, working with our citizen scientists, um, we've seen that a lot of those um, forests that were so badly browned um, during that summer are starting to come back. Um, and so you can see this is one year on. Um, the trees uh, can often recover. Um, so even though they look quite dead um, during the drought, they may not yet be dead. And so to understand the long-term dynamics of the implications of these droughts and fires, we really need to be able to predict um, how the trees recover. Um, and so we are tackling that on a couple of different fronts. One of them is thinking about the processes involved. So how do trees actually recover? Um, and so this is, this is really a carbon story. So plants have carbon reserves. Um, in their stems, trees do at least. Um, so this, um, again, we're turning to microscopy to vi visualise what's going on. Um, before a stress event, the trees have lots of starch granules stocked away in their wood. Um, to regenerate their canopy, they use that starch to rebuild. So there's really a carbon cost. And so it's understanding how much carbon there is in reserve and how much it costs to rebuild and how long it takes to rebuild those reserves that's going to allow us to predict the capacity um, for recovery. Um, we're also really understanding that the um, recovery from drought involves not just rebuilding the canopy, but also really rebuilding the xylem. Um, so again, um, microscopic microscopy is allowing us to visualise um, that during drought you lose capacity to transport water, um, but following drought the trees will rebuild that xylem to rebuild um, the water transport capacity. Again, it's costly in terms of using carbon. Um, so understanding that cost is, is um, the way that we can go about understanding the degree to which trees can recover. Um, the other angle, of course, is to try and understand what's actually being seen um, in the forests following um, these events. And so 
uh, on the plots that we set up during the, um, during the black summer, um, we have revisited, uh, we being quite a team of people whose names are shown there, um, to see to what degree um, the trees have recovered. And so what you can see here um, is the fraction of the canopy that was dead during the drought, the fraction of the canopy that is dead during the recovery phase. So this is about nine to 12 months following um, the first, uh, following the drought. Um, what we're seeing here at the moment is that it's quite variable. So some plots have recovered really well, some plots have really not recovered. Um, but on average, we are not seeing a lot of recovery. So if you take that average across all of the plots that we saw, the trees that, that were dead are pretty much staying dead. So we are looking at quite a long-term impact for the most case of these droughts um, on these ecosystems. Um, so the recovery when you, when you have um, uh, trees that have died, um, of course, is much slower because then you're looking at um, plants having to come back from seed. Um, and so another aspect, and this, this one is going to be a lot harder to predict um, but is still really useful to monitor, um, is looking at the processes that lead to seed set. So we're working with um, other collaborators um, at the Hawkesbury Institute to look at um, plant pollinator interactions um, and seed set. So that, that work is actually sponsored by um, Hort, Hort Innovation um, because they're interested in having the pollinators present um, for the apple orchards, but it's also feed, feeding into our work to help us understand um, the dynamics of ecosystems following um, drought and fire. Um, so if I can just quickly summarise the drought progress, we have made a lot of progress over the last couple of years um, in quantifying the thresholds for hydraulic failure, for drought failure, um, and how they vary across species. We think that we've made a lot of progress towards being able to predict drought death um, and consequently fire risk. Um, but the thing that we really need to tackle to be able to predict the ecosystem function into the future is to think about what happens following disturbance. Um, on top of that, of course, we have warming going on. Um, and so um, uh, the trajectory of warming is really strong. There's no sign that it's going to turn around. Um, it's likely to continue quite strongly into the future. Um, can we predict the impact of that warming? Um, that's actually a much more challenging question than drought. And that's because warming has many impacts on plant function. It affects pretty much all aspects of plant function. And that makes it quite a lot harder to predict what the consequences will be. Um, one of the things that we know um, is that there is a, um, there's an optimal temperature for growth. Um, so whenever you grow plants at different temperatures, you'll find that their, their performance is, is low at low temperatures, low at high temperatures, but there's, a, there's an optimal temperature. Um, but that optimal temperature varies quite dramatically across different scales, um, which is something that we're still really trying to understand. So here what I'm doing is contrasting a seedling experiment um, that I showed you on the previous slide. And that seedling experiment was with three different provenances of Eucalyptus terita cornus. So one from the very south of the country, one from the very north of the country. Terita cornus is one of the species that has a really wide distribution. Um, and you can see that all three provenances have an optimal temperature for growth, which is around about 28 degrees, which is quite high. Um, if you, however, go and look at um, diameter growth in field plots across the same range um, from the south to the north of eastern Australia, as was done by Linda Pryor and Dave Bowman, 
the optimal mean annual temperature for growth was actually just 10 degrees. Um, so very much lower. Um, and this is something that, that I'm still working to try and understand. How do we explain this great difference um, in responses to temperature between what happens uh, in a glasshouse and what happens in the field? And one of, one, of the, um, one of the factors is to do with the interaction with water availability. So we, um, uh, we did a, a nifty extension to our experiment with seedlings. Um, in our seedling experiment, we warmed them, we grew them at different temperatures, but we gave them as much water as they needed. So they were watered to, you know, to keep the soil wet. Um, but then there were another set of plants in which we only gave them as much water as the cold-grown plants wanted. So the ones that were grown at higher temperatures were not kept well watered. They were given exactly the same amount of water as the cold-grown plants. Um, and so what you can see here is that um, that really impacted the growth at higher temperatures. And so the plants became water-stressed. Um, uh, at really quite low temperatures. And this has fairly, I think, important implications because what it's saying is that the water limitation of growth um, increases with warming even if precipitation doesn't change. So you will sometimes see reports in the literature talking about, well, rainfall's not changing, so we don't expect that water stress will change. But if temperature's going up, even if rainfall's not, water stress increases. Um, so there's a, there's a strong interaction with water availability. Um, and then the other factor um, is the variability. So in our glass houses, we have constant temperatures. Out in the field, of course, you have very variable temperatures, um, which can be very low, can be very high. Um, and so we've, we've experienced that a lot in Western Sydney over recent years, as we've been through temperatures of 47, 48, pushing 49, um, and so um, there's, it's a, it is a great place to do research on heat wave impacts um, on plants. Um, and one of the um, most insightful experiments that we have run is one using the whole tree chambers that we have out of the Hawkesbury campus. So these chambers, they're 10 metres tall. Um, you can enclose an entire tree in there. If you're using eucalypts, they'll grow to the top of the chambers in the space of two years, which is quite convenient. You can do an experiment with a big tree quite rapidly. Um, so we had eucalyptus paramatensis trees in here. Um, they were about 10 metres tall. Um, the, uh, the other really great thing about these chambers is that you can enclose the canopy of the tree and use, um, uh, use the chamber as a kind of cuvette, which means you can monitor the carbon and water exchanged by the tree canopies on a really short-term time basis. So every 15 minutes, you know how they're doing. How much carbon are they taking up? How much water are they using? So we expose these trees to 43 <laughs> degrees for four days in a row. And you can see from the IR camera which ones were the high, the heat wave chambers. Um, 43 degrees, four days in a row. Um, the experiment was led by some of my colleagues, John Drake and Mark Chelka, who are originally from the US, and they were really quite concerned about 43 degrees for four days. It's kind of like, oh, should we do this? Are we going to kill the trees? Um, whereas the Australians on the team were like, they'll be fine. And they were fine. They were absolutely fine. There were like two leaves that went brown on the trees that had those heat waves. Um, so the trees were fine, but what we learned from that experiment was how they were fine. How did they make it through those heat waves? And again, it was a water story. So at high temperatures, the plants weren't photosynthesizing anymore. They couldn't take up any more carbon, but they were still transpiring. And because they were still transpiring, um, they were staying cool. So transpiration for a tree is when water is coming out through its pores, much like sweating for us. Um, and so the leaves on these trees stayed below critical thresholds. 
through this process of, of transpiration. Um, and that has important implications for what happens during drought as well, because really what's going on here is for these trees to get through the heat waves safely, they need to have access to water. Um, and so what we saw again during that black summer um, was that the impacts of the drought were greatly exacerbated by the heat waves in regions where the trees had less access to water. Um, and so uh, you could actually see like the impact of the heat waves um, in browning the canopies. So our understanding of, of warming, um, so just to summarise very briefly, there's, there's been less progress in predicting the effects of warming on vegetation function. And it's, it's like I say, it's a tricky thing to try and predict, partly because the warming that we're seeing at the moment is quite gradual, plants can acclimate, so adjust to that warming, but the main impacts would appear to be through the interactions with water availability and with heat waves. Um, so the warming amplifies drought stress, the heat waves amplify the drought stress. Um, but we still have a bit of a way to go in understanding what the, what the impacts and consequences will be of warming for the vegetation. Um, so lastly, I want to talk about CO2. So the other thing, the other big driving factor that's going on at the moment is the rising CO2 concentration. Um, and so this is, you know, this is actually, it is quite a dramatic increase. Um, I started my research career in 1990, 1992, um, when the CO2 concentration was just 350 parts per million. And we're now starting to push 420. So it's really dramatic and it's something that you can see over the course of a research career. Um, now the impact of CO2 on vegetation um, is largely one of increasing growth. Um, and there is really quite good evidence for greening um, in response to elevated, to rising CO2 over the last few decades. Um, so uh, this map is taken from some work done by NASA um, just to illustrate uh, the impact that there has been. Um, I've also been involved in a review recently where we tried to pull together all of the evidence um, to look at CO2 impacts over the, past dec over the past few decades as well as into the future. Um, and it's really, it is quite consistent. There has been a greening effect. So some of what you're seeing here um, is not about CO2. Um, so the greening in China, for example, is afforestation. It's not rising CO2 having that impact. Um, in Australia, you can see that there has been quite a lot of greening, especially down the East Coast. Um, and some work that I've done recently with colleagues from the Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes, Martin Dekau and Sammy Riffey, um, we've been trying to... Um, separate out the CO2 signal. So try and work out how much of that is due to CO2. Um, and our estimate is that over the last 30 years, there's been a 10% increase in average um, in uh, leaf area um, due to CO2 alone. Um, so there has been an impact of CO2. Whether there will continue to be one in the future is a really important and fundamental question, um, one that we've been trying to tackle with um, the uke face experiment. Um, so this is a free air CO2 enrichment experiment in Western Sydney, um, about uh, 60 minutes drive away according to, to Google Maps. Um, so this experiment was set up in 2012. It's in a um, mature native woodland, Cumberland Plain woodland, um, and we are giving, there are six rings, and three of those rings are getting an extra 150 parts per million of CO2. Um, before we started the experiment, we ran some models to try and predict what we thought the impact of CO2 would be. Um, to try and nail down exactly what it was that we needed to know from this experiment. Um, and so what you have here is 
um, eight different models being applied to that experiment in advance and saying this is how we think um, that elevated CO2 will affect the growth in these experiments, in this experiment. And you can see that the models really disagreed quite strongly at that stage. Um, the predictions were anywhere from no change to um, a 30% increase in growth. Um, and so that exercise was really helpful because it helped us to narrow down the range of predictions and what we would need to get out of the experiment to be able to figure out which of these models was, was more correct, or which, which hypothesis embodied by the models was more correct than the others. Um, and so um, what has been found by the UKFACE team, um, the plants are consistently taking up more carbon. Um, so at the leaf level, the photosynthetic rate of the plants is consistently higher um, throughout the whole eight years of the experiment. But um, uh, after, after the first four years, we found that there was no increase in growth. Um, and so that poses a really important question is what, is the, what are the plants actually doing with that extra CO2? Um, so they've taken it up, but where is it going? Um, and so we, um, there are about 50 of us involved in trying to put together um, a complete carbon budget for this ecosystem. Um, and this involved collaborators from um, a huge range of different universities trying to track down where the carbon has gone. Um, and so we were measuring pretty much every component of the ecosystem that we could think of from the photosynthetic uptake through the trees, through the understory, through the roots, through the soil, through the mycorrhizae, the losses at the bottom of the system, um, the losses to insects, the losses to the volatile organic carbon. Um, where is that carbon going? Um, and the, the upshot of that was really that mm, the extra CO2 was largely coming back out from the soil. So it wasn't staying in the ecosystem. Um, so the trees might be photosynthesizing faster, but the carbon wasn't, the extra carbon wasn't staying in the ecosystem. And our best understanding of why that's happening is that this is a very poor soil. It's very phosphorus limited. Um, and so a lot of the carbon um, is going to below ground processes. Um, and we think that could be because the trees are trying to take up extra phosphorus and they would need to do that if they wanted to support extra growth. We've also put together a phosphorus budget um, and the phosphorus in this system is pretty much um, tied up in the microbes in the soil. So the plants are really competing with the soil microbes for phosphorus and that's one reason why in the first four years of the experiment they were not able to grow faster because they weren't able to get access to the phosphorus. So one of the things that we're doing is tracking, still tracking what's happening over time to see whether that investment by the trees below ground is enabling them to take up extra phosphorus and support growth down the track. Um, we are considering phosph phosphorus fertilising some of the rings to see if that would enable higher growth. Um, but the other thing that's happening out there um, and I'll stop this if I can. Can I stop it? Hang on. Nope. All right. I'll just have to let it go. Sorry. Um, these trees have been through a lot over the time of the experiment. So um, we had, first of all, a psyllid outbreak in 2015, um, which was actually quite widespread across Western Sydney. Um, we've had several heat waves. We've had a really severe drought. Um, and we also have some native vines which are starting to invade. So we're, we're actually looking at, a, at an ecosystem which is being impacted by disturbance. Um, and you can see here that the, the lianas um, are starting to uh, take off, um, which gives us a really good opportunity to understand um, uh, the trajectory of an ecosystem under disturbance, the competition between the trees and lianas, um, as well as whether the elevated CO2 um, gives the plants, well, 
which of, the, which of these species of plants does it benefit over time? And so there is a, a really large group of scientists focused on the dynamics um, of the experiment uh, over the past four years. And you can see here some, um, it's terrestrial LIDAR scans tracking one of the rings over time. You can see how the trees are growing, but you can also see how the lianas are growing as well. Um, and the, um, these results are still coming together. Um, and I, you know, I don't have anything peer reviewed to show you my understanding from my own observations and looking at the data, but don't quote me on this, um, is that the elevated CO2 is actually providing some benefit to the plants. So the, the elevated CO2 tree uh, rings are, are, are less impacted by those disturbances, but they're still impacted. So there's some benefit of the elevated CO2, um, but it's certainly not enough for the, the plants to, to not be declining over time. Um, so there's some really interesting results emerging from this experiment. Again, we're working with a group of modelers worldwide to try and incorporate these results into global vegetation models, which will enable us to make predictions uh, into the future, um, uh, which incorporate uh, the CO2 and phosphorus interactions. Um, so just to summarise, um, where are we headed? Um, so I don't have nice predictions of exactly where we're headed yet, but you can see we're making a lot of progress. We know that vegetation change is happening, has always happened, is happening faster, um, and is, you know, is certain into the future. It is really important. It, if, it will impact on all of those values that I outlined at the start of this talk, but it's predictable, and we really need to be trying to predict what will happen uh, into the future so that we can anticipate and adapt. Um, and I'll just finish by acknowledging there have been many people who fund, many people who participated in this research, many people who funded this research, um, and uh, many thanks to New South Wales government um, and the ARC in particular. All right, I'll finish there. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for uh, a number of questions. Uh, I will say, I mean, I have a property out on the other side of the Blue Mountains. It's been really, really interesting to see the amazing recovery this year when everything looked completely dead. Uh, and uh, the resilience of the landscape is amazing. And, of course, it's brought out all the mice. Right. <laughs> uh, in that sense. And yet, at the same time, I, uh, as commissioner, have been up and down the coast looking at the forest. And the forest, some forests are definitely completely dead. Uh, and other ones, it's interesting how quick they have recovered. It's a very, very, very... Yeah, sorry. Questions? Sorry, yeah. Uh, you, I've got this microphone. You can have that microphone. Oh. <laughs> sorry, last question. Uh, my first observation, of course, is that uh, just behind your talk is a whole lot of trees. And I find that somewhat ironic that the organised Professor Hugh... Uh, organise that. Um, my other observation is, from my experience, Australian trees and eucalyptus have fairly shallow roots. And I believe this because historically we've had um, intermittent or light rainfall. And I thought European trees tend to have deeper root stems. Am I mistaken yeah, there? You, you are, I'm afraid. Um, eucalypts have very deep roots, um, much deeper roots than, uh, than European trees. There are... Um, uh, colleagues who work in Brazil who can dig much deeper holes than we can, who, you know, they've got um, uh, 10 metre deep trenches to study roots in eucalypts. Um, so it's, it's actually um, one of the strategies that eucalypts use, um, and it's partly because of the high variability of rainfall. So rainfall patterns in Australia are much more variable, particularly on an interannual basis, um, than on other continents. And so... Um, the thinking is that the, the deep rooting strategy of the eucalypts is, a, um, is an adaptation strategy to cope with multi-year droughts. Um, and certainly we work um, with a lot of people studying drought mortality around the world. Um, we have uh, 
um, a joint project looking at uh, mortality of spruces um, in Germany at the moment, for example, and literally their roots are about this deep and that's why they've died um, in the most recent drought, um, whereas, you know, a eucalypt... Um, and you, we saw it ourselves um, in this most recent drought. It was two years of drought before we really started to see it in many locations. Yeah. Just to follow up a little bit on that, what about soil quality as well? I've never quite understood. I mean, is the soil quality generally poor here? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so Australian soils in general are very old, um, and that means that they are poor in uh, nutrients because they haven't been replenished um, recently. Mm. Um, All right, yes. good. Sorry. Um, thanks so much for your talk. Um, my question is about the stages of death of a tree. So we know that humans have different stages of when we classify them as dead. And you said that some, uh, we, don't, we thought they were dead, but then they weren't. Um, is there some insight in, into how to classify this and when we actually say that a tree is dead? It's, um, it's actually a really tricky question and something that we debate all the time is how do you decide when a tree is really dead dead? Um, you, um, often the only way to tell if it's really, really dead uh, in an experiment is to rewater it again and see if it comes back. <laughs> um, so, but we, we had this with our citizen science project because people really wanted to know, well, how do I know if this is dead? Um, and one way that you can really tell is when the, when, the, when the outer bark falls off and you're left with a skeleton underneath, then it's really dead and you know that tree is not coming back. But it can actually be quite some time before you know. So um, my colleague Rachel Nolan is travelling around uh, New South Wales at the moment trying to look at um, uh, death rates following the fire. And in general, she's not ready to pronounce death for two years. It gives me more hope for my office plans. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> they have shallow roots, though, yeah. Uh, further, yes. Yeah. Um, do you have any views about... Um, carbon sequestration from vegetation trees versus artificial man-made methods of pumping carbon back into the ground? I mean... Um, <clears throat> uh, so, I mean, trees, trees are the best method of vegetation, let's say, not just trees. Vegetation is clearly the, you know, it's the, the pre-existing method for storing carbon and pumping it back into the ground. Um, and so there was a lot of joking in our community when Elon Musk announced a prize for, you know, let's find solutions to this. People were like, tree? <laughs> um, uh, but there's also a lot of debate in the community about the need for land to do that. So tree planting in particular is, um, uh, needs to be approached with caution where it's done. There was a really... Um, there was a paper that caused a lot of controversy um, two years ago which kind of said, you know, here's the world and here's where we could plant all the trees to take up extra carbon. And a lot of the regions that they'd identified were actually intact grassland ecosystems, which are precious. Um, and so it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's not a straightforward question. Um, it's also important to say it's, you know, vegetation is is a useful strategy for storing carbon, but it is certainly not the only strategy that we can use because we simply don't have enough land um, for, for it to, to soak up the amount of emissions that we need. Don't really have any comments about artificial mechanisms. That's kind of beyond my range of expertise. Well, I might follow up briefly on that because, again, another one of my part-time roles is I'm now chair of this Net Zero board uh, because Mr Turnbull, Turnbull um, opened his mouth over it. Um, uh, there is a leaf in that which basically says we should be better using our land to sequester carbon. Uh, is there, a, uh, you know, your learnings here, is there a good way of simply getting more carbon sequestration for our dollar out of planting or better use of land or whatever? I'm going to say I mean? yes, 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 and I, yes, yes, I believe so. Yep, absolutely. There is, there is scope for sensitively approached um, replanting, revegetation, soil carbon management schemes. And I think, you know, a lot of the farmers and pastoralists are on to that already, um, ways of managing soil carbon. Because having, 
having more soil carbon is not just good for carbon storage, it's actually good for productivity yeah, yeah. and many other things as well. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that we need to address is stability uh, into the future because of all these effects that I've been talking about, the droughts, the fires, the rising temperatures. Um, when we replant or adopt new methods uh, to try and sequester soil carbon, we really need to understand how the how that's likely to pan out in future as well and think about you know, what, what's going to happen to these ecosystems over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 yeah, years. 50 years. Okay, thank you. It's interesting. Got one there. One there. Just come to you in a second. You've alluded to some species that may be thriving. Have you, have you done any work on which species are doing better with the you know, the challenge of climate change and everything else. And is that changing where species are grown across geographical areas? Um, I think we're still, we're still kind of in early days with understanding which species are most impacted and trying to understand why. Um, certainly there is a lot of work going on trying to understand so that you know, the, the differences in vulnerability across different species are quite striking. Um, in most instances they're quite well adapted to the environment in which they're found. So as I said that meant that there's, there's not necessarily particular species that are impacted, it does tend to be um, the suite um, of species. Um, and so the the plots that we have done looking at the drought impact, it's, it's not obvious that there are specific species standing out, um, either in terms of recovery or um, the impact. So um, one aspect of recovery is the capacity to re-sprout. Um, and so some of our sites are dominated by species that can epicormically re-sprout, which is the, you know, that sort of hairiness that you get after fire happens after drought as well. Um, a, but in terms of recovery after drought, it doesn't appear that there's a big difference uh, in recovery between the epicormic and the, and the non-epicormic species. Um, so I guess we're still, still trying to understand that. There's differences within species as well. Um, so there are adaptations within a species. You'll get different provenances, that some of the provenances are more resilient than others, um, which is... Uh, a useful thing to explore because it's a, um, if you can identify those resilient provenances, you can use that genetic material to replant. Um, uh, there is some evidence um, for relict populations um, being really heavily impacted. So another group that I'm working with is in South Australia, um, looking at um, some stringy barks, which are really very much a relict population. They're kind of outside their distribution and they're being quite heavily impacted. So in some cases, it's the, it's the outlying populations, but it's also not always the outlying populations. There are really clear examples of where, you know, species that are right in the middle of their range, populations that should be quite well adapted are being quite heavily impacted. Well, one more question there. Um, hello. Sorry. Hey. Um, thanks very much for your talk. That was really, really interesting um, and really important work. Um, I was just wondering whether your models extended at all um, into like coastal ecosystems, specifically looking at like mangroves, um, and if not, uh, whether there was any similar work being done on those ecosystems. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. And so there was a big mangrove dieback event uh, in the in um, names gone. You know. Queensland, <laughs> um, uh, which so and we've been looking at the um, the role of hydraulic failure in that event as well, and it, it is actually the same so, sorts of processes um, and the same processes involved in recovery um, that impacted on the mangrove ecosystem. To model a mangrove ecosystem, there's a there's a few more things that you really need to take into account. It's not it's not quite as um, not quite the same suite of processes, but in terms of the biology, it's, it's not dissimilar. Um, so, yes. Okay. We have to bring proceedings to a close there. Thank you again, Belinda. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good. Uh,
Thank you for a great talk. Um, our next seminar will be on Wednesday, the 23rd of June, when Professor Francois, wait for it, Agwe Jensu from UNSW will be presenting on hydrogen science and the future of Australia. Uh, we will continue to live stream all seminars. It's been a great location. We can actually get more people in here than we can in Parliament House, at least under current restrictions. Uh, so thank you all for coming and having a face-to-face -face seminar. Thanks very much again. <laughs>